welcome to my channel if you're new here hi hello i am Sherilyn, and i am so glad you found me today we are talking about a, another case that i have never heard about and i'm not gonna lie it's one that has now made me side eye my neighbors who i love but i've been side eyeing for the past few weeks it's the case of jimmy schaefer and angela stolt and it's a case of betrayal that rocked a community to its core. It made everybody question, how well do you truly know your neighbors? First of all, I put my foot like that. I okay, go ahead. Back. You, gotta, you gotta put your foot on my shoulder? Go ahead. No, I'm pushing ah. back. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead. I kind of slid into his lap. Okay. So I can get my feet up like... That. Okay. And gotcha. I use my feet to push the BBC. James Schaefer was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on August 3rd, 1976 to parents Thomas and Mary Schaefer and also had a sister named Kristen and brother named Andrew. He sounds to have had a pretty typical upbringing his family said that he was a, a big sports guy loved baseball and was really good at it and after graduation he moved to deltona beach florida in 2007 and he and his common law partner candy moved in together she had a son from a previous relationship and so the two of them kind of merged um, as a couple raising his son, her son, and then the two of them had three children together, two sons and a daughter. After being together for over 10 years, it's safe to say that they knew each other pretty well. They knew their routines pretty well. And James was a driver for a company called Blue Diamond Limousine. And he wasn't just a driver. He was one of the most requested drivers in the company. Staff and clients were big fans of his. And so it wasn't uncommon for him to go on long drives, sometimes even overnight, if it was clients who like insisted that James be the guy to take them where they needed to go. So on April 2nd, 2013, when he was scheduled to drive a group to Kissimmee or from Kissimmee, sorry, to Tampa, Florida, which according to Google Maps is about an hour, 45 minute each way, this was not like an unusual type of drive for him. And according to reports, James got back from the trip and returned to the limo company around 3 a.m., but never made it home. Candy was unable to get a hold of him. So the first person that she reached out to was his boss to see if he was still working and maybe picked up another assignment. And his boss said, no, he had left several hours ago after getting back from work and he was supposed to go back on another trip later on in the day, but he didn't show up and his truck was still at were. Candy then reached out to James's father who he was really close to to see if he had heard from him and he hadn't and by the time that she had contacted him it had been about 24 hours since anybody seemed to have heard from him so his dad at this point reports him missing. The investigators go to James's place of work and they speak to a mechanic that said he saw James at 3 a.m. and it was actually James who woke him up while he was sleeping in like the, the staff lounge area. I'm assuming maybe this was something that they did if they were like in between shifts and they just needed a mechanic on call. But James woke him up and said that he was having issues with one of the limos. So he went to go look at it and he said as he was going to check it out, he saw James walking towards his truck and then a vehicle with his lights off and tinted windows pulls up and the mechanic hears what he described as a male voice calling for James to come over and told him to get in the car, which he did. Safe to assume that whoever... James got in the car with did not take him home and there were several theories that were swirling around everywhere from foul play to even James leaving on his own. He had confided in several friends and even some co-workers that he was experiencing some financial issues 
and investigators had learned that he had some troubles with gambling, he hadn't paid his rent in months, and didn't even have running water in the house at the time. On top of that, when investigators spoke to Candy, she had some information that kind of supported the theory that he may have gone on his own. She shared a text that came through from James on April 3rd that said he was hiding out from somebody, but that he was okay. Another person who had confirmed these issues that he was having was a neighbor named Angela Stolt. Angela, her ex-husband, and her children had become very close with James Candy and their kids. And with James often having like a late night schedule, him and Angela became pretty good friends because she was known to be a night owl and usually was awake when he would get back from work. So it was pretty routine for James to get home from work, have some drinks at Angela's. And it sounds like she was somebody who was easy to talk to and open up to because she was also very transparent about struggles that she had in in her life too. She was born into a military family. Her father was in the U.S. Air Force. So the family was constantly moving and she and her sisters both expressed that it was very hard for them to feel secure and stable because right when they would get comfortable somewhere, the family often would have to just like get up and move and leave all of their friends and, you know, memories that they made there behind. She was actually even born in Bangkok, Thailand in April of 1972. And when the family moved to Georgia, Angela said it was a really rough time adjusting to that move. She was dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression, which is hard enough when you add on all the struggles of being a 15-year-old, entering high school, trying to fit in. And so when she did go into high school, she ended up meeting a boy who was three years older than her. And at 15, after her freshman year, she dropped out of high school and married her boyfriend. Not long after, the two then moved to Deltona, Florida. According to Angela, her husband was very controlling. He kept her from her family, didn't allow her to make friends, and was allegedly quite abusive. So around four to five years after they got married, they got divorced, and she admits she had jumped into another relationship pretty quickly. And so when she was 20, she got married for a second time. Three years after getting married, they had a son together, and then not too long after that, they also got divorced. By 25, she was married for a third time, and they had a daughter together. And this is where she moved with her husband and children on to the same street as James and Candy, and all of their kids played together. So they got really close as friends. Candy and Jimmy were even there for Angela when she and her husband divorced in 2011. Angela claimed that this relationship was also very toxic and that he had just up and abandoned her and the kids with no support and she was really struggling financially and confided in her friends and family that things were not going well and Jimmy and Candy were part of those that she talked to about this and they wanted to try to help out where they could. So they hired her to do some bookkeeping for Jimmy just to help out uh, making some extra money and apologies I think. I don't know if I've gone back and forth saying James and Jimmy but James and when I was doing research like everybody was basically referring to him as Jimmy. So Jimmy is James. James is Jimmy. Finkel is Einhorn. Even when Jimmy went on social security for disability, Angela acted as the bookkeeper slash manager of his checks. Angela was the payee. So I guess she was the one who would cash the checks, do his bookkeeping, try to manage, you know, all of his incoming outgoing bills and stuff. And in exchange, he paid her $100 for doing the work. I was really confused about hearing about the situation of her cashing the checks. I wasn't sure if this was just like something that if you were getting those checks like in the in the USA, you needed somebody to, I don't know, 
I'm, I'm always like blaming it on being Canadian. I'm like, maybe things work different, but things do sometimes work different from where I am and from where a lot of the viewers are, not just in the US, you know? So um, I, I wasn't sure if that was like a thing, but then I learned that it sounds like the police were also quite perplexed on the situation. And when they asked Angela about it, she said that the only reason that she did it was because James had insisted that she put it in her name. And so she explained that he wasn't good with money. He owed a lot of money to a lot of people. And she was trying to get him caught up, get deaf, 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 debt I don't know why I felt like I had to say debt debt paid off and it she said it was just easier that she do it and then try to help him manage because he was constantly in overdraft every month and even with it coming through her account and him trying to like pull things and pay people off the stress that was getting put on her from it was was putting her account in overdraft because she was not really managing it well enough to like keep up with everything that he owed she basically ended the first meeting with investigators saying that since his disappearance they had not been in touch she hadn't seen any withdrawals coming from that account which allegedly he also did have a card and access to which is how things kind of like slipped through the cracks because he would just pull money that sometimes wasn't there but she said if she noticed anything suspicious on the account or heard from him she would let them know as days pass no one has heard from jimmy the investigators go back to angela to check on things see if he reached out and they did this multiple times i guess and every time she said nope she hadn't heard anything and one time she even invited them in just to prove like she had nothing to hide wasn't hiding him out or anything like that and there was no sign of Jimmy, but investigators said it was it was clear she was struggling with issues like within her own life. Her house was basically it, it, a, a hoarder's house, not healthy place for her or her kids. There was garbage everywhere. It smelled really dirty. There were dishes piled, rotten food. It was it was just a rough rough situation. And I mean, this doesn't mean like she has something to hide in regards to their investigation, but they decided that they wanted just to kind of have a formal interview with her regardless. Angela had a lot to share with investigators. The first thing she started with though was just shutting down any suspicion that her and Jimmy had anything more than a friendship going on, but she did say that he was not in the best relationship with Candy. She said it was quite abusive in her opinion and that Candy was the abusive one. Angela describes Jimmy as being one of her only friends and self-describes herself as quite a loner. And then she drops the tidbit that he, she had heard from Jimmy after he was reported missing but didn't want to say anything. She said that she had received a text message from him that morning and said, I can't get it. Keep the cash for yourself. Angela responded to the message just telling him that police were looking for him but she said she never got a reply back. Then she said not only did she get a text from him, but she also saw him. And she said it was the day after detectives initially came to talk to her and he came by and said that he needed some money and that she told him she had deposited deposited it for him, but she actually didn't and he was quite upset. Now, I saw the interviews on Explore With Us on YouTube, and there were a lot of opinions on how this interview had gone down in the comments, and a lot of them were directed towards how the female detective had done the questioning, and I have to admit, it definitely seemed like she was, I don't know if it was like nervous, just like firing off a laundry list of questions all at once, and in instead of just like asking one at a time, and then just like waiting until you get the response and then move on to the next one, which I think is pretty key in in it. Not that I'm like a professional here, like listen to me, but you know, in interviews where you ask a question and then you just kind of like stop talking and like boldly look at somebody and it makes them so uncomfortable. They just kind of like start rambling and eventually you kind of get somewhere. And this, this wasn't the case. There was like a lot, it was overwhelming even just to listen to. Um, but Angela said that the only reason she was even the payee on the account was because he 
told her that he and his wife were fighting a lot and he he wasn't really sure if he could trust her on it and she said for weeks he was begging her and begging her and that there was nobody else that he felt like he could go to and trust like he did Angela he told me his wife and they were fighting a lot so when you became the payee of his social security or whatever why did you become the payee on it he begged me like for weeks and I told him no several times no 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 I don't want to do it and He's like, I got nobody else. I just wanted to help them, you know? Mm-hmm. I've always just wanted to help them. Right. I tried to get his financial situation straightened out, but he's always stealing money from somebody and needing money for this, that, and the other. The detectives also put a lot of theories out there from him being somewhere with her husband who had, you know, she was saying had gone missing and then was like, well, he's not actually missing. He's just not here. They also really heavily pushed the scenario for her to consider that if he was out there somewhere alive and she knew that he was alive or knew who he was with, the safest thing to do, not even just for him, but for herself would be to say where that is because if if something happened to him and he was with somebody else and she's now admitted that she's one of the last people people or if you know like the last person that that he talked to when he came just to stop by after the interview like she was going to get blamed for what happened to him so i asked you straight up today have you seen him you said no you told me that several times right and then what happened you tell me the truth so there's there's the problem Now, I told you and I promised you that if you were honest from this point forward, we're not even going to deal with that. We're not even going to worry about it. Okay? It's, as far as I'm concerned, you have a clean slate right now. As long as you're honest with me and you continue to be honest with me and you don't impede my investigation any further, you understand something? Do you understand what's going to happen if this turns into a homicide? Have you ever thought about that? Have you thought about if somebody actually does find him before we find him? You're not telling us the truth on X, Y, and Z. And meanwhile, everyone who's after him finds him and they don't give a shit about him. And if he ends up dead in a ditch, how are you going to feel about that? Horrible. The interview basically ended then with her saying she understands but has no idea where he is, hopes that he's alive and well, and that if he shows up again or texts her again, she'd be in touch. So several weeks pass and the investigation is still going on and then a call comes in to the sheriff's office on April 21st, 2013 and on the other line is a woman who is requesting a Baker's Act for her sister who she is saying is suicidal and who is confessed to a crime that is currently being investigated. For somebody who doesn't know what the what Baker's Act is like I didn't it is it is for someone if you believe that someone is a danger to themselves or others police are within their right to take that person into custody and hold them for like a, a psychiatric evaluation usually in a facility for like 72 hours just to ensure that um, either they stay longer or they're good to to go 911 where's your emergency um, my sister needs to be Baker acted, and she needs to talk to a sheriff's officer. So she tried to hurt herself this evening? What's going on? She has pills, and she's threatening to take them, and she's admitted to a crime that she's being investigated for. Where Where is your sister at? She's in the house uh, hugging her kids goodbye. Why is she hugging her kids goodbye? Because she came to the house. And she told my parents that she committed a crime and that she's being investigated for it. Um, she says it was self-defense, but I don't know. I don't know what the situation is. I told her I didn't want to hear it anymore. I walked out of the house with the telephone. So. The woman on the 911 call was Angela Stoltz's sister, April. And when police arrived, April met them outside and said that Angela was threatening to take her life because she'd committed a crime and was basically there with her family to sign over any parental rights of her children to the grandparents. And this is when she confessed to her family that she had drugged and strangled James Schaefer. When police entered 
the family home, it was very obvious that Angela was in the middle of an emotional breakdown. She was reportedly hysterically crying. Allegedly, she asked for an attorney. And when she was detained, she was initially transported to the sheriff's office where an investigator had told her like, okay, like you're now in protective custody and just explaining that this was like within their rights to not only protect others, but also to protect herself. At this point, she's even more upset learning that she's going to be held. And as she's being escorted out of the interview room, allegedly she she's walked past one of the investigators who had initially spoken to her. And she whispers to him, you should have come into my house that first day. You would have ended all of this before it got to, to this point here. Before she could elaborate any further, she's taken away. And then after she had received a psychiatric evaluation, she was deemed to be relatively mentally stable enough to speak to an investigator again. This time, Angela alleged that on April 3rd, the day that Jimmy disappeared, she wanted to play a quote April fool's joke on him she said that she wanted to get back at him because he had lied to her and others so many times and she wanted to lie to him and see the look on his face when she said it was a lie to see how he felt and let's talk about the i guess you said it was for black a better term you wanted to play a April Fool's joke on him. Well, it wasn't really an April Fool's joke, right. but it was. You wanted to like, kind of get back at him in the in the term, in the sense of, this is how you've treated me. me, right? He lied to me so many many times. Right. So you wanted to turn the tables and lie to him. I just wanted to lie to his face and see how he felt. And then, how was the lie set up? He'd been trying to get money from his father. Okay. He drained his father dry. I mean, yeah. beyond dry. I think his father took out wounds. Give to Jimmy. Okay. According to Angela, Jimmy had gotten a lot of money from his father. He, in her words, had drained his father dry and he was wanting to get more money from him. And so not only is she seeing what she's done to her father, who she says he's, you know, taken out loans and stuff to try to support Jimmy and get him back on his feet, but Jimmy then asks Angela to ask her father if he can help him out. This, I guess, is something that she had helped him with in the past. She was able to borrow some money from her father to help Jimmy out. But this time she said it was different because her father had recently been diagnosed with a terminal illness. So he's asking for a few thousand dollars to borrow. And it upset her. According to Angela, the amount that he was wanting her to ask her dad to borrow was around $4,000. And that was to cover, you know, paying back some other people. It's like borrowing, what's the saying? Borrowing from Tom to pay Peter or something like that. And then also pay his rent, which like we had established earlier on had not been done for several months. Apparently, in exchange for borrowing money, Jimmy even offered to put the title of his truck in Angela's father's name. So she said, okay, I'll ask him. And when investigators asked, like, did you have any intention of getting the $4,000 or asking your father? She said, no, she didn't. And because like of of the lying and the borrowing from people and putting her account in overdrawn like she was just really mad but she wanted to let him know what that felt like so she lied to his face saying yeah like this money is coming when she knew that it wasn't and so she said she picked James up from his work around 4 a.m. Her kids were actually in the car with her and then they went back to Angela's house she admits to detectives that the drinks that they were drinking were spiked with a prescription muscle relaxer to what she said was enhance the effects of the drink and that James was aware that this was in there and she said that he even had like crushed the pills to put them in the drinks. Then just before 5 a.m. she tells 
Jimmy to get in the car that they're going to go talk to her father in person about the money and see if he was, you know, ready to lend it to him and how he felt about putting the title of the truck for, you know, some collateral. And on the way there, she says that she pulls into the Austin Cemetery and told Jimmy that they were just going to pull off and, you know, wait about 15 minutes because she didn't think that her dad would be awake just yet. So they were just kind of like buying time. And it's here that Angela says she admits to Jimmy that she had never actually asked her dad to borrow the money and that she would not be asking him to borrow money from him anymore nor would she be trying to help him with his finances and that she had lied to him according to Angela after she tells Jimmy this he is irate she said that he threatened to not only kill her but also kill her kids and things got physical when he was trying to choke her then I tell him, I said, my dad's not going to give you any money. I'm not going to give you any more money. And I'm going to turn off the check cash in advance. And that's when he gets irate. He's like, I'm going to kill you. And he starts turning towards me and he puts his arm over on my arm like that. Mm-hmm. Before the three and I can begin, I want you to sit here. Okay. You said this would be the driver's seat, and I'll sit in the passenger seat. Okay, I'll be Jimmy here. And you're telling me, again, I'm Jimmy. I'm not gonna, you're not gonna pay me. Now, you said, go ahead. What was he again? I can't recall. What did he say? He said, I don't remember word for word. He was irate, and he started scaring me. And. So, what's the thing with the arm? Tell me. Uh, if you don't mind, can I touch you? Is it okay? I don't okay. Care. What what did he do with the arm? Which arm was it? Yeah, it was that arm. This arm, right arm. Okay, he put on my shoulder and he started like putting his thumb. Oh, into your shoulder, like your pressure point right here? Okay, now what did you do? <laughs> you grabbed him back. Okay. I pushed that and um, okay. after that he started pushing up and pushing towards me. Still, like, with this arm extended, pushing his thumb into your shoulder joint right there? He was pushing his thumb into my shoulder, mm-hmm. and he was also pushing, pulling his body up, pulling, pushing towards me. She said while he's attacking her, she panics and reaches around behind her seat for something to defend herself, and she reaches into this box that she had where she's trying to collect camping gear and felt around and grabbed an ice pick and plunges it into James's eye. She says it didn't kill him though and he got like even angrier and just kept choking her. So again, she reaches behind, feels around, finds another tool and this tool is basically a homemade garrote. It was this long cable with PVC pipe handles on both ends and she said that this was like within her camping tools um, for like a makeshift like climbing climbing a tree tool she says while he's still attacking her still trying to choke her she manages to wrap it around his neck and pull on it like get her foot up against like his chest and strangle him to death i grab the other side of it he has my arm like that Mm -hmm. i grab it like this Mm -hmm. and i grab it like that and then i put my feet Mm -hmm. (laughs) i Hmm. Sorry. No, it's okay. First of all, I put my foot like that. I okay, push go ahead. Back. You gotta, you gotta put your foot on my shoulder. Go ahead. No, I'm pushing ah. back. Okay, gotcha. And you, but you have each piece of the, the what, where is this hand? You have the pieces of the PVC. Each hand's got one. Now pick your foot up. You said you were pushing on me. Okay. Anyway. Go ahead. I kind of slid into his lap. Okay. So I can get my feet. Up, like that. Okay. And gotcha. I use my feet to push the PVC. You got each piece of the PVC, so now the rope is just around Jimmy's neck. Yeah, but and he was already trying his best to push me off. So now he's pushing on you. Mm-hmm. to get Because you're pushing, but you're countering him with your legs and you're pulling on the PVC pipe. 
Okay, each piece of the PVC. All right, keep going. Keep going. I remember at one time my foot slipped, and I keep the ice pick. I push it deeper. I- oh, ow. <laughs> okay. She also admits to removing the ice pick and that that's still in the one eye at the time and putting it in the other, stabbing it really into the other eye to make sure that he was dead because she felt like he was going to come back and kill her. If all of that is not horrifying enough, she then told detectives that she panicked and didn't know what to do. She didn't think that the police were going to believe her that she had killed him in self-defense and she didn't want to lose her children so she worked on a way of getting rid of jimmy and disposing his body and concealing the evidence i mean viewer discretion should be advised if you're watching true crime in general but this is intense disturbing she started with having a pretty interesting disturbing explanation for the absence of blood in her vehicle and she had mentioned that she was looking around for something in her box and found saran wrap so she had like wrapped wrapped the saran wrap around his head where like the injuries from the ice pick were and just like so coldly explains how like in order to fit it she had to like make holes within the saran wrap for the ice pick to still be in in his head i'm trying to be informative here and also and you know sensitive and I'm disturbed. So she she didn't take it out is basically what I'm trying to say. She kept the ice pick in and then like made holes like so the saran wrap could like hold tight and then it was out. She then like props him up in the passenger seat and drives home. She said she parked in the driveway, ran into the house, opened the garage door, drives in, closes the garage door, opens his door where he starts to fall out and grabs like one of those like kid kid pools and puts it under to like catch to catch his body she then said looking at him she knew in order to conceal his body hide what she had done she needed to make him smaller so in her garage with her children in the home and she just told them to not come in the garage she dismembered james after dismembering him she placed his remains in pots on the stove and inside her oven so the reason that she wished they had searched her home earlier is because the first time that they had talked to her outside her house she was this is so disturbing she was actually boiling parts of james And if they had been like a little bit closer to the home when they were talking to her, she said that they would have been able to to smell that. By the time they actually had gone to her house and and looked inside, she said that she had already disposed of James by that point. She had taken his remains in multiple garbage bags and put them around town to make matters even worse she admitted that she had her son come along and help her because the bags were too heavy for her to just carry on her own and told both of her children that she had hit a deer and then had to you know cut up the deer in the garage and needed them to help her get rid of this deer but it was actually james now what did you do with the uh with the remains I put them in bags, put the bags on the side of my garage. Were they heavy? Very. And then I pulled my car in the garage and I still loaded them up. I was in such shock. I don't remember. What did Matt think he was loading into the car? A deer. I told him I hit a deer. She also confessed to being the one who was texting his family and friends from his phone, impersonating him just to buy more time and make it seem like he was alive. Through the interview, Angela also directed investigators uh, along the side of State Road 415 and pointed out all of the areas where 
they could find either evidence or the garbage bags. They were able to recover some evidence. They were able to recover some of Jimmy's remains, but not all of them. Sadly, some of the bags were taken deeper into the woods and they were ripped open and empty, which led investigators to believe that animals had found had found the bags before they got a chance to. And one of the most disturbing things that the investigators found was evidence that she, you know, was not making up the fact that she had placed him in pots because there was a pot that was found that still contained what they described as like a gelatinous gelatinous mush um and like thick liquid with very 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 foul odor her explanation for doing that was that she was she said she was trying to boil down the remains and then like essentially like burn them into ash in the oven. I've definitely had to like disassociate a lot during this case because it's just so impossible to to grasp the reality of this. Like I I I cannot imagine ooh, what uh, yeah, what learning all of this would have done to James's family, his his wife, children. Like it's so so disturbing. And DNA was able to eventually confirm that the remains of were Jimmy. I mean, at this point, I don't know why, you know, if it wasn't him, Angela would like admit, admit to all of that anyways. So two days after she confessed on April 23rd, Angela was arrested and charged with James Schaefer's murder. She was initially charged with second degree murder and then those charges were ultimately upgraded to first degree murder when the grand jury heard the case and believed that None of this was done in self-defense, that it was premeditated, and that Angela was basically as cold as as they came. The fact that during one interview, she said, I'm sorry, but I put Jimmy where he belonged, in my opinion, at the time is is pretty, pretty cold and telling to like her mindset at the time. On December 2nd, 2014, Angela's trial started and she stuck to the story that she killed Jimmy, but she did it in self-defense. And the prosecution argued that like this was horrific and very premeditated and she did it because of money. They did believe that Angela was enraged by Jimmy's irresponsibility with money and then having her involved with the money coming into her account and her going into overdraft caused a lot of stress in her life and because she was like dealing with financial struggles on her own and then a separation and stuff that that the money was the motivating factor but that you don't I can't even repeat like again like what she, you don't do what you did because you're stressed out and mad at somebody about finances there also was the insinuation that she did everything that she did and tried to cover her ta- her tracks by buying more time to continue to collect the checks. So there's, you know, the the angle that maybe there wasn't really stress or there was stress, but then there was the revenge factor of being like, um, I'm going to make it look like he's still alive and I'm going to continue cashing these checks myself and keeping the money. One of the most damning witnesses for the defense was somebody who supported the prosecutor's version of events that this was premeditated, and that was Angela's sister who called the police in the first place. And she said that when Angela had called that family meeting and confessed to killing James, she told the family that she had drugged James while they were drinking. So when she was telling the police that he was aware of the muscle relaxants in the drinks and had done it for like, you know, like heightened effect, that wasn't true. She, her story was that Angela told them she drugged him and that when they left, he was completely out and she strangled him. So there was no, you know, him attacking her and and her feeling like she needed to protect herself. April said Angela told them he was unconscious. She also added that it wasn't until after he was strangled that she 
stabbed him in the eye to make sure that he was dead. So none of those versions line up in the timeline of her trying to like first like stab him and then it did you know it didn't do anything and that he was still still trying to attack her and so then she strangled him and then just to make sure that he was dead put it in the other eye. It was it was very different. Things for Angela got only worse from here when when she decided that she needed to testify in her defense and try to convince the jury that she did this in self-defense. And instead of showing just like an ounce of remorse, she very nonchalantly just describes what she did to Jimmy's body, what she did, you know, after the fact to hide what she did while her kids were home, even sharing that her kids had complained about the smell and that she said that she had like caught a rat and was boiling it. She also didn't didn't skim over any details. She described having to remove the ice pick from James's eye because when she tried to put his head in the pot, it wouldn't fit in the pot because of the ice pick. She also further changed her version of events claiming that the ice pick was still in his right eye which was the initial eye she said that it that she stabbed him in when she got home and that she didn't remember removing it and stabbing him a second time but you know she she implies that obviously it was her but that she just didn't know so I think she was trying to push that she was having some sort of like psychiatric breakdown after being attacked but when you have that initial investigation footage, she, which was shown to the jury, she was the one to disclose to the detectives that she, after she had strangled him, then stabbed him again with it in the other eye. The most incriminating evidence in, in all of this, though, was the fact that the plastic wrap and blue gloves that were found in evidence were purchased from Walmart with her children on surveillance a few hours before the murder and the ice pick was also purchased like around that time so these weren't just things that she happened to have collecting in her box she said you know over time these were things that right before the crime happened she had gone to pick up with this proof of it looking like, you know, premeditation is absolutely present. That's uh, when her charges was were bumped up to first degree murder. There were also charges added of tampering with evidence and one count of mutilating a dead body. On top of that, there was, you know, just added evidence that she's twisted because as investigators were looking at her computer, they found a folder that was called Yummy Gore. And inside of it, there were like saved images of other bodies that had been mutilated also. Ultimately, on December 5th, 2014, after deliberating for almost three hours, the jury found Angela guilty of first degree murder, guilty of tampering of evidence, and guilty of abuse of human corpse. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and an additional 15 years and five years for the mutilation and tampering charges. Now, Angela actually has a website that is dedicated to her innocence. And the argument that she has on there is that she killed him in self-defense. I've been through it. And if you, I guess if you didn't know anything about the case, it could possibly be convincing because she admits a lot of stuff and makes it seem like very convincing that she she basically describes that she had like this like snap reaction similar to the way that battered wives do but even says in there that um you know she had never had a relationship like that with jimmy where like that fight or flight would have gone in like about him thinking that, okay, like this is it. You're not going to do this to me anymore. And that it was always her just talking about being angry that he was a liar and bad with money. I I, I did go back on um, Explore With Us after going through the her website because it did make me think like I was like, oh my gosh, 
You know, like, is she kind of convincing? And they, I love that they have like very, like a, a very qualified team. And often, you know, there's different, different areas of expertise that analyze everything. And they mentioned that there was no evidence of like delusional thinking or, you know, paranoia or any type of like psychosis that was going on in, in any of the interviews that they saw with her. They pointed out that like all of her communication was very like clear. She was very coherent and was able to recall very detailed aspects of the crime clearly. Another thing that Angela talks about in the site is that she argues that it, she wasn't really given a fair chance because of where the trial was and believes that it should have been moved. She also blames counsel and has a lot to say about her sister too. But I think once you look at the case in its entirety, like like the weapons that she says, like she was like able to reach in the back, on the floor, behind the driver's seat while you're getting strangled, not once, you know, like once if you were able to do that, like, wow, like good on you, but like twice. And then the, the, the dismembering and, you know, actions after doing that as well. And then you like recruit, recruit your, your kids to help cover up your crime. I think when you look at all of that in its, you know, in its entirety and see, I, I don't want to say she was in her right mind because like that, you, you like people in their right mind don't do this type of stuff but the the actions that were taken after clearly show that she was very aware of what she was doing and what she did and what she was trying to cover up and it's that is in itself is like is so disturbing because no matter how you put this like it all stems around money the fact that whether or not she was upset about her accounts being in overdraft and just like snapped that he was trying to borrow money from her father and his father like n none of it is just like that that doesn't that doesn't make sense to to lose your mind that much over 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 that stress it's like just just take just take him off the account and stop talking to him you know so when i think about that i think that the idea that she was still wanting to collect the checks makes a lot more sense but I'm very interested in in hearing what you guys think I just I haven't been able to make like any sense of this case at all whatsoever it is one of the most disturbing ones that I think we have discussed on here together and gone through so I hope you know you guys are are all okay after hearing this I am thinking will forever be thinking about Jimmy and his family and I feel so bad for them that after what she's done like they they're kind of left to have to defend him and yeah maybe he wasn't a perfect person in being in terms of being able to manage money and make you know maybe some some irresponsible decisions but it seems like you know he was he was he was a very innocent person who you know just needed to maybe download like credit karma I don't know murder and what happened to him is definitely definitely not on the list I don't know people are like I just yeah Jurassic jail you guys Jurassic jail like let's get on this I'm so serious somebody track down the old professor let's find the mosquito this I feel like we I feel like it can be done I feel like it can be done and um yeah we'll bring her we'll let you know let jimmy's family you know pull the trigger let her drop t-rex ready ready to go okay i have to go that is it for me today if you if you haven't already please please don't forget to like and subscribe it helps me so much it means so much like i said i have big goals and yeah i'm not gonna lie the 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 algorithm is just like not loving sherilyn right now so like if you could like share and like and comment and do all the things it really helps me and it tells youtube that you like me and then hopefully we find other people that like me or i just have to like give up and nobody likes me but um i like you so okay i will see you in the next video i will miss you terribly until then make sure to love each other love yourself and i will see you soon bye